This was an idea that um, I had having a conversation with some of our kids. They were asking me a lot of questions about who I was, where I came from, and especially when I started here at Yates. They, they don't know who we are as teachers and as adults and that people that are responsible for them and, and what we do for them ac academically and educationally, but also emotionally and socially, et cetera. They have no idea who we are. And so I was watching a, a, a series of Oprah's master classes one day, and I thought that would be a really good idea for our kids, for, us, for our staff members, all of them that would be willing to do it, is to share who we are with our kids, because a lot of them don't have a clue as to who we are as adults and how we got to where we are. I, I wanted to be able to give them just a glimpse into our, our personal lives and professional lives that they can perhaps understand our journey as to how we got here. So that, that was the purpose of why we're doing this. I make it when the Who am I? Um, my name is Kenneth Dwayne Rollins Davis. Uh, a lot of people don't know that and I don't use that name a lot. Uh, because Rollins is actually my real father's last name. Davis is my stepfather's last name, but um, being a part of a, a, a mixed family sort of, sort of, um, I think my mom took the route of, of, of giving me the, his name just to make things easier uh, and, and, uh, and so on and so forth, so there wouldn't be a lot of confusion in the family. When I was born, um, I was born in Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, and um, what I didn't know at the time was that my stepfather wasn't my father. And I had to figure out, uh, as I got older, where my place was with a family. And being the youngest of six other brothers and sisters on my mom's side, um, I'm baby, I'm the baby, number seven. I didn't know until I was 17, 18 years old who my real father was. And assuming that this man that I had called my father all these years um, really didn't like me. Didn't, and I never figured out why. And so that made it interesting in terms of growing up in a family where your mother loved you and adored you and, and did everything and it was some private things that she would do for me that she couldn't or didn't do for my other brothers and sisters because I was different. And I, I always heard that word uh, from the time I was little that I was different. And I didn't know what it meant. And so being able to, to understand that growing up that I was gonna be different, um, I look back on that and I think, okay, maybe they saw something that I didn't see. So long story short, my dad had his own family, uh, my mom had her family, and then I was born, I was the only one born between the two families. I was baby number 16 between the two families. And um, when you're growing up in an environment where the person that you think is your love caregiver who loves you and takes care of you, hates you, and you realize and you wonder along the way, like why did this person treat me like this? Why, what did I do? And you never know. Um, it all comes out into how you behave as a human being and what you think about the world around you because if you're treated that way, you automatically assume that you should treat other people that way because it's what you learn. Um, and it took me a long time to overcome a lot of that because I had a lot of hatred in my heart for people because that word love, I didn't hear it a lot. And it came out when people did say it, it was because they wanted something from you. And so that was how they the game, so to speak, was played when I was growing up. It was some hurt. It was uh, a lot of uh, verbal abusive things that were said to me and about me, and uh, even a lot of some physical things. And it was different because my brothers and sisters weren't treated that way, and I couldn't figure out why it was happening to me. And a lot of times, while it was happening, my mom kind of was in the background. I didn't know if she understood what was happening or she was trying to keep the peace, um, but or she, because she knew I was not his child, that some things she just kind of let go, I think. I can't explain it uh, because it was, it, 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 but it definitely shaped me who I was as a person because once you go through something like that, you think everybody's like that, especially when you're so young. I think it's definitely impacted my relationships with people, especially people that I, I want in my personal life. It, it definitely affects how I treat them because I'll go to a certain length and a certain distance with them and then I get cold feet and I start to wonder, uh, is this the right person for me? Am I in the right place? Do they really love me? Or, you know, do I really love them? You know, all of that. Um, and it definitely shapes your thinking and, and your mental state around what love is. Um, even to the point when I decided that I wanted my own family, I adopted two kids. I didn't have any natural born children of my own and I wanted to be able to do it differently because I felt that my genetics weren't strong enough to carry 
a love for a person that was within my own blood. It's crazy, I know, but that's what I was thinking growing up. Like, I'll never have any kids. I don't, this is, the genetics is they're gonna be alcoholics or drug addicts and they have this addictive behavior. I don't know how to help them if they get to that. To that. And so what I did was I ended up adopting two boys, one and three years old at the time. Unfortunately, they've dealt with some, some of the repercussions of my childhood growing up and, and some of the things that I've done or said to them. And, and not that it's been crazy. I've been able to know the difference, but um, I think I was probably tougher on them than I probably could have been at certain times. And I, so I know that was part of that. Um, and, and I say it was out of love and respect for them, but I know that in the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe it was a little too much sometimes. All of that shapes you as the person that you are. And so when I'm, I'm 49 years old, I'm, I'm going into the latter part of my career and I'm still trying to figure out if I'm the right person or the, or the best person that I can possibly be to keep going in the direction that I'm going. I'm very blessed with the life that I have and my faith in what I do and how I do what I do is, is, is strong. I, I believe that is strong. But personally, I'm always wondering if I'm the right person. Because many times uh, I've said to, people, said to people, I'm really not supposed to be here. I, I was supposed to have died a long time ago because growing up I had major seizures as a baby and they weren't sure what was happening that, would, that caused that. Um, and that I, it, it probably should have killed me. Um, but I believe that God chose me for some other work. And even though if you want to do all my other stuff, I believe that he's still trying to fix me along the way to get me to be the person that he wants me to be so that I can be that for other people. So that's what keeps me going. I really have a strong desire to try to make other people's lives better because I know what it's like to grow up in the projects. I know what it's like to be in an abusive situation. I know what it's like to have your entire world around you fall apart and you try to figure out how you're gonna be successful and make, make something out of yourself. I get that. Um, but people look at me and they don't think that I've been through a storm. They look at me and they think, oh, you know, you're, you know you've, you've been very blessed, you've been fortunate, you're smart, you have these degrees, you got some money, you got a nice house, all that. They look at all the stuff, but they forget that sometimes the person in all the stuff can be broken. And I think that in a lot of ways, I'm a broken person trying to be better at who I am and how I do what I do so that my healing comes from helping other people. As, as I mentioned, some of the, the downside of my life um, and not knowing who I was or where I came from and all those kind of things, it started to shape me as to why, why was I still here? Why did I choose to do other things? And I, I would tell people, uh, I would talk to some of my, from my friends, they're like, well, how did you get here? And as I look back over my life, I, I realized that, and, and my faith is that God kind of put people in my path at certain places and certain times to keep me on the track that he wanted me to go on so that I would be successful, so that I would be able to help other people, which is what I know he wants me to do. Um, but I know that I, at times, I got tired of being the good kid. I got tired of being the person, everybody was like, oh, he's so goody two shoes, I, you know, and I, I got tired of that. So I wanted to, to try to be someone else and, uh, and God just never let that happen. I, I just believe that he navigated me around a whole bunch of stuff because a lot of my friends that I grew up with are dead or in jail. Um, and a lot of them lost their lives to doing some stupid stuff, getting involved in drugs. I've never done any drugs my entire life. I was, grew up around it, which is, I think is pretty, pretty amazing. Grew up around it every day. And I never, I never smoked, I never took any illegal drugs, I never did any of that kind of stuff. Um, it, it's just funny how you can be in the midst of all of that, and then for some reason you're protected against it. I, I can't explain it, but that's what happened to me. And um, growing up in the, in the project, having we grew up on welfare, and you would be surprised at, at some of the things that we've had to eat, or even go without eating, because we just didn't have any money. And um, it was a lot of us in the house and trying to figure out, you know, when you're in the projects, nine people living in the house, there's not a lot to go around. So I ended up being, um, we ended up being very creative on, how, on some of the things we had to do to, to just to eat from day to day. I believe that, that everybody has a purpose and a, and a reason for existence and a reason to do what they do. I just don't believe everybody understands what their true gift is. 
And sometimes when you, when you look to see what your gift is, you have to really search deep within because not everybody opens their gifts at the same time. Some of us open them later in life. I think I consider myself to be a late bloomer because I didn't even have um, an understanding what the world was like in terms of relationships until I was almost 25. I just, I, I played basketball. I went to school, I went to work, went to church, I played basketball. I, went, I mean, that was my cycle. And I was afraid to let people get close to me because I didn't know, I didn't know what their intentions were and I didn't want to be hurt. I had grew up, you know, when you grew up with that kind of stuff, you just kind of put people behind you and say, you know what, I'll help and do anything I possibly can. I just won't let them cross this line. And, I, and, and that's how I grew up. And when I finally got a chance to open up and let somebody in my life that uh, I wanted to love and figure it out and try it with. You know, I spent 18 years of my life with that one person trying to say, okay, this is good for me, this is right for me. Um, but then I learned a lot. I learned a lot about life, uh, living, trust, love, family. You know, you, you kind of get that from someone who trusts you enough and believes in you enough to give you the chance to experience that with them. But the problem ha that happened for me was that I got scared. Even in 18 years, I got scared. It's like, okay, I'm, is this person going to be with me the rest of my life? You know, is something going to go wrong? And so you start to have those doubts in the back of your head is that, am I worthy? Am I good enough? And so those are kind of the things that, that can deter you from even things in your professional world to say, am I good enough? Am I supposed to be here? And so I, I, I really wanted to um, just let people know and talk to the kids about that you can still manage everything that you need to manage and live and survive and do all the things you're supposed to do and still be a broken, still have a, a broken heart or be a broken person and still be successful. And I think our kids need to hear that because of some of the circumstances that they go through or have gone through or will enter into their lives at some point, it, it may break them, but that doesn't give them a reason to quit. My goal and my intentions, even though I'm, as I said, I'm entering the latter part of my career, hopefully not my life, my, my career, is just to still send the message, message and share the message to my children, my personal children, my children that I work with, the staff, and anyone else who, who understands life and, and, and willing to, to hear that it's okay that you're not perfect. It's okay that you didn't have a, the, everything that you wanted growing up. It's okay that life treats you bad or has taught you of some very bad lessons uh, about how to survive. But it's not okay to give up. It's not okay to use that as an excuse to treat other people badly or to, to break the law or to be in multiple relationships with people at the same time. And, and I mean, it's, it's, none of that stuff is okay. But. But I think that when you learn that life has something special for you if you work to get it and achieve it, you can still be a successful, happy person. We just have to understand and know that it takes work. And I don't want our kids to, I don't, I don't want the kids that I work in service to think that anytime that something bad happens, you give up and it's okay. And I also want them to think that everybody, every adult that's walking around in this building is perfect. And that has everything put together because most of us, I would venture to say 99.9% .9 of us who are walking around this campus or in any campus or any place on this planet has had challenges. Some of them have taken them down to their knees and then they've gotten up somehow. They've had enough energy and courage to stand up and say, you know what, I can still make this possible. I can still be someone. I can still make my life better. And I think as, as long as we stay on that, that track and in that frame of thinking, truly anything is possible. But you also have to be realistic about what the possibilities are for you. I mean, I know I will never be president of the United States. It's not my goal. I don't even want to become superintendent one day. I mean, everybody's like, you just need to do this. That's not my goal. My goal is to get as many people on the right track of their own lives as possible through education, if I can. I'm really trying to see if I have worked with a million kids. If, have I touched, have I been able to touch a million kids at this point in my life? Because that, that to me would say that I've accomplished the goals of trying to make an effort. But if I've, ever, if I've been blessed enough to touch a million kids and hopefully make their life better, lives better, then I've done a lot of the things that I think God has said for me to do. When people think of mastering, I think they think they, it's something that they own. Um, even if you look back to slavery terms, which is not something I, I, it's part of our history. We just know that. That there was a master and a servant. 
And I think in a master's class, there is a life that leads you and you become a servant to it. And so I think these types of classes are master classes because we are all teachers and learners at the same time. And anyone who has the creativity to share their experience with other people to make their lives better, you become a master teacher, but you're also still a student because life constantly teaches you lesson after lesson about how to be better and gives you choices to make. Do I go left or do I go right? And you still have the ownership to decide. So when you're looking at mastership or mastering classes or mastering master courses that help people and guide them, I think that it supports us and it gives us at least somewhat of a guide that says someone else has walked this path before me and maybe I can learn something from them so I don't make the same mistakes that they made. Or at least I have the awareness to say, I've heard this before and I know what I can do to make a better decision for myself.